Hello, and welcome back. From the Migration Policy Institute, this is Changing Climate, Changing Migration, the podcast that explores the different ways climate change is impacting the way people move around the planet. My name is Julian Haddam. I'm the editor of MPI's journal, The Migration Information Source, and we're bringing you this podcast as part of our focus on climate change and migration. You can read our collection of articles about the issue at migrationpolicy.org slash climate. In the Americas, one of the things that has attracted a lot of attention in recent years is the movement of migrants from Central America, particularly the so-called Northern Triangle of El Salvador, Guatemala, and Honduras. Though migrants from these countries make up a pretty small percentage of immigrants in, for instance, the United States, their movements north have become a focus of policymakers, journalists, and the public writ large, especially when it occurs in high-profile caravans like the ones we've seen since 2018. According to some analysis, this migration is being driven by climate change. Drought in the region's dry corridor, which runs along Central America's Pacific coast from southern Mexico down to Panama, has been an issue of concern for several years. And in November 2020, problems got worse when hurricanes Ida and Iota slammed into the region. To help make sense of what's going on here, I'm happy to be able to talk to Diego Pons. Diego is an applied climatologist at Colorado State University who researches how humans and the environment interact with each other, and he's done research on Central American farmers, among other issues. So Diego, thanks so much for coming on. Thank you for having me. So let's start with the big question. How much of the migration from Central America is being driven by climate change? So uh, that's a good question, Julian. Um, in fact, we have a lot of incomplete data sets. We have uh, some lack of understanding of the full mechanisms behind certain conditions that we're observing uh, on the ground. And uh, it's, a, it's a difficult uh, question to answer. Um, in fact, um, many of the data sets that we're currently using are uh, you know, having some difficulties identifying the spatial distribution of precipitation or the magnitude of precipitation. So if we attempt to derive uh, you know, conclusions on causality behind this, we might be just not telling the whole story. Um, on the other side, trying to correlate this with uh, migration, we also have uh, incomplete information on, on the other side, on the, on, the, on the migration side. On you know, one of the data sets we currently use is apprehensions in the U.S. Right, as a as a proxy to um, migration from from Central America into the U.S. But that is also incomplete. Right, one of the things that uh, uh, we know is that not everybody is apprehended at the border, um, and so at the end. Trying to connect the dots requires uh, an in-depth analysis and acknowledgement of the of the complexities behind this. Um, so I cannot tell exactly, you know, hey, this is A equals B here because it's a it's not a linear road uh, that way. Mm -hmm. But but you talked about questions on both sides there, both uh, in the region, questions about uh, the precipitation levels, and also questions about. Um, what immigration or what migration northbound is looking like in the region. Um, so I mentioned drought. How much do we know about the drought that has been going on in this region? Mm -hmm. like, what can we say about it? And particularly, I mean, can we attribute it to climate change? Or is this places have droughts sometimes and this is just a drought that mm -hmm. is unconnected mm -hmm. to climate change? Yep. Um, this is a great follow up. So um, we've done research at several timescales in Central America myself and a, and a group of uh, other scientists from other universities in the U.S. and in Guatemala uh, have done research on, uh, we've done research on paleoclimatology, so reconstructing previous centuries of precipitation in the region. And we found uh, at that level, at that scale, you know, what tree rings can tell us is that current droughts were not out of the ordinary in the region. Now, that's uh, accumulated precipitation at a seasonal scale derived from tree rings. Um, drought is more complex than that. Right. Um, and, and I wanted to, to drive the attention to an important factor here. And we tend to not talk about soil moisture, for instance, or evapotranspiration. And the reason why I'm, why I'm mentioning this is because um, in the last, you know, 2014, 2015 and 2016 uh, drought, that was attributable to El Nino uh, phenomena. Right. So as we know, El Nino is part of natural variability. Right, it's driven by uh, oceanic conditions and atmospheric conditions interacting, and naturally, uh, we know this that when there is an El Nino, specifically an intense El Nino, 
we uh, could expect droughts in Central America. Um, this droughts, however, can be influenced by what we do know about climate change, which is temperatures have, re have uh, gone up in Central America. We know that is one of those certainties that we have when it comes to Central America and climate. And so there are interactions there that you can start to think about, right? If we have a natural variability like El Nino or La Nina, but in addition to that drought, right, that mechanistic um, shift of the precipitation and the winds, what if just rising the temperature in Central America is enough to lower soil moisture, for instance, and, and therefore we could have, uh, you know, crop losses all over the place. In fact, during the 1998 El Nino, that was the case. We have an extent drought and extend a midsummer drought as well as uh you know precipitation in central america is uh, usually divided in a bimodal precipitation regime so two peaks in the year of precipitation that valley in between was really really low uh and that dictates um some of the sowing uh dates as well so it is I'm, I'm trying to just explain the complexity behind this so if we have increasing temperatures despite precipitation doing whatever it, let's just say precipitation remains the same just increasing that um, temperature could uh, have an impact on, for instance, agricultural endivores, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so, so it's not just rainfall or precipitation. It's, it's not just rainfall. There's a couple of things going on. Okay. Exactly. In fact, if you analyze, you know, um, monthly data on, on precipitation, there's little variance, actually. That doesn't mean that our instrumental data and even satellite data can capture differences that are affecting farmers on the ground. We've heard from farmers that the uh, precipitation regime is changing, not only starting dates, right, but the uh, length of the midsummer drought is changing. They've, they have expressed this and they know what they're talking about, right? They've seen it firsthand, they can uh, count the damage. And unfortunately, it has an impact on their morbidity, mobility and mortality, right? It's, it's really hard uh, when this actually comes to be a reality. So, um, Currently, we are we are trying to do more research in that topic and in understanding well this um, disconnection between the narrative on the farmers and what we see on precipitation. And again, the story might be more complex than that. Let's just consider the incremental temperatures, right, in Central America. Let's consider evapotranspiration rates and soil moisture. What is happening on the ground that these farmers are actually uh, trying to tell us? So it's it's a uh, it's from a scientist perspective is you know, we need to be more humble in terms of how we approach this. And this is where, you know, I think disciplines like geography can bring this together on the, you know, human environment interactions. Um, but it, it, it's, it's uh, I think we're starting to scratch the surface of these complexities. New data sets are, are becoming available. Um, you know, we're understanding more by integrating multidisciplinary research on the ground. Um, records of crops are actually incomplete at, at, at best in Central America. Mm -hmm. So we are also starting to, you know, capture some of that, um, of those records actually, uh, because people like a decade ago started to notice, oh, this is important and relevant for ourselves to then make those correlations. So I think altogether, um, considering all the factors, we are literally starting to just scratch the surface of these complexities. Um, yeah, sorry, not, I'm, I'm not gonna, you know, say, hey, this is a drought and, and, you know, next day people is out because I've seen uh, many different cases around this. I have seen those. I have seen uh, small farmers uh, whose, um, you know, coffee is going down because low market prices. So there's there's intersections there with many other uh, ways in, in which people is affected. And so I guess to talk about, let's talk about those people then, instead of talking about the environment, which is, and the climate issues, which are, as you know, pretty complex. So about the people, um, the, uh, there's a UN report from, I think, 2017 that had found about half of the households in these countries, uh, from which someone had migrated that these households were food secure, food insecure, rather. Uh, that is obviously a huge amount. Um, listeners of, to the show will note in previous episodes, we've talked about the link between food insecurity and migration. Um, and kind of the obvious, seemingly obvious connection that not having enough food uh, can affect one's decision to migrate. But I know, Diego, you like to complicate that process, right? It's not simply, much like you like to complicate the questions of drought, uh, it's not simply the case that uh, precipitation or temperatures are slightly different and you can't grow as much. And so therefore, 
you pick up and leave and move northward. But there, but instead, that some of these environmental and climatic changes in variability can cause really the destabilization and the undermining of entire agricultural systems, right? Which can either force people to look for ways to adapt, and migration might be one of those ways to adapt. Right? Can you walk me through the process of what is happening on the ground in terms of these farmers, the coffee farmers, who I know you spent a lot of time with, um, or others, and how they are responding to these uh, environmental changes and how migration fits in with the environmental and food security insecurity challenges they're facing? Right. So many, many questions there. I'm going to start with um, social networks um, and safety nets. If you think about uh, any any entrepreneur, any any person going to do business who doesn't have access to loans, who doesn't have, you know, obviously credits and, and uh, soft credits and um, insurance you, you, I don't know. It's, it's, it's difficult for someone to just manage the whole risk of any business. Uh, now we're talking about smallholder agriculturalists, uh, the majority of them, uh, who are actually doing this and you know, trying to run their 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 business, their their plots, which usually are small, very small, by the way, 0.5 hectares or so, um, without any other um, support. Right, is literally them going by themselves, uh, usually um, having help from the family itself. But you know, if if, if uh, and 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 climate is going to hit, there's going to be climate shocks, right? That's inevitable. It's climate variability, uh, potential of climate change in the future as well. And 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 farmers elsewhere and farmers of any other size will actually you know transfer that risk right to an insurance company. Um, again, the the same land size allows them to have access to credits, but these smallholder uh, farmers are put in this place where they cannot count on this. So just picture the case in 2014, 2015, and 2016, right? This extended droughts associated with El Nino. Let's say the first year, well, you lost your crop, then you plant again because you have some seeds that you were planning to use on the second, on the segunda, right? On the second uh, sowing date. Mm -hmm. But then you decide to use it to just catch what is left of, of precipitation in that first cycle. But then it failed again. And then you're left with nothing. And so you decide to sell part of your plot, right? To pay for those seeds and inputs. Obviously, it's more than seeds, it's fertilizers, it's pesticides, it's a lot of other things. Uh, and then the third year, and this is three years in a row of droughts. And then you have, what, what do you have left? Uh, um, you know, again, there's no access to, to credits. So maybe a family member is willing to give you some money or not. That might be the case. Uh, but usually there's other uh, coping mechanisms, including migration, right? Um, so what I'm trying to exemplify here is that it's just not, again, uh, a deterministic, oh, lack of precipitation and then I leave. But people do try to adapt. People has been uh, adapting for a long time. It's just, um, you know, when the um, bread basket prices are going up, when low coffee prices and other commodities are going uh, down, right? And you cannot harvest the coffee because it's not profitable. Um, so then you don't hire um, unskilled labor to help you in the farm. These people have left with few options, really, really few options. Um, and, you know, some of them are not lucky enough to go through the next cycle. And then they, they migrate to the cities to look for an urban job, uh, which usually don't pay as well anyways. And so, you know, it's, it's a very complex situation. Um, if you had lack of um, access to health, Right. So, again, those, those safety needs that I was talking about, you know, family members might be one, but, you know, the system, the social system uh, in, in place should also have your back at some point. Right. And it doesn't. Mm -hmm. um, and then access to uh, improved seeds can be complicated. So uh, it's it's it's, again, complex. Mm -hmm. So um, coffee farmers. So that was the case of smallholder farmers who might have a they, they might have a plot. Right. And they're doing agricultural and the themselves. And then they might actually have a half a job uh, picking coffee too. And there the story is also complicated because we have had the lowest prices um, in a couple couple years in a row um, where production costs were higher than what they were being paid. Mm -hmm. Naturally you're working at a you know at a loss. And that that's also complicated uh, themselves because coffee farmers have experience uh, climate variability and change in addition to this um, market uh, 
very stressful situations associated with uh, market prices, right? Um, so I don't know. I don't know if you know if we go talk on on agriculture at large. Each large farmer, smallholder farmer, they they are all uh, facing this challenges associated with climate. So in a sense, um, there is an impact on 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 climate and agri and agriculture, right? Mm -hmm. It's just the 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 lines are not straight. You have to to connect the dots there. So I guess let's talk about connecting the dots. I mean, how easy is it to connect those dots ahead of time? And I guess what I'm asking is how easy is it to predict migratory movements uh, and other types of adaptations based on individual events? Let's say we could go back in time uh, six, seven years before the 2014 drought, and we knew there would be a drought. Um, would we be able to predict? Could we predict? Did we predict um, who was going to migrate, who was going to take other um, strategies to mitigate what was happening? Or what kind of... Talk to me about the the thought process there and the challenges in predictions. So great. Um, first challenge is uh, incomplete data sets. We just started with this conversation st stating that, right? So that's the biggest uh, you know limitation that any modeling agent would have, right? If you if you need to model, you need to have the best data. It's a it's a say that goes like you know whatever you put in the model is whatever you're gonna get. So let's put high quality data, and we could expect something that approaches reality. But still a model, right? And um, within what we have, uh, it's, it's limited. The, the amount of modeling and forecasting that we can do here is limited in terms of, um, you know, we don't know um, where these people is currently working in this uh, coffee fincas, right? We don't really know how many of them are working there. We don't really know how many of them lack access to social security. Mm -hmm. uh, but we do know other uh, information. We, we know, again, that the breadbasket is going up. It's, it's pretty much steady. Uh, you know, the last 30 years has been steady up. Um, we do know that coffee prices are low. Um, and so that's trying to, you know, draw some of the uh, vulnerability indicators that we could try to include in a, in a model to, to forecast this. And the other side, on the climate side, uh, there's been great advances when it comes to the forecasting systems. The Columbia University has just released the uh, next generation of seasonal climate forecast. And, you know, uh, it, it's, a, it's an amazing system, which actually has predictive skill when it comes to precipitation, uh, temperature, and so forth. Bringing them all together, there is um, there is a signal there. There is a signal that we could use at some point to understand, again, if, if, we, if we figure out the mechanisms behind all this uh, data sets that could eventually, um, you know, influence um, um, uh, a farmer decision to migrate, then we could we could work on it. But again, it's just it's just beginning to uh, to work. We're starting to have these new forecast systems. We're starting to get new information on the ground um, through many agents and, and agencies that are working with us. So I guess to answer your question, there is there's hope that sometime we could do this if the right data set is uh, used as input. And uh, you talked about the, the project from Colombia. I know you've also done some projections of future rainfall and uh, precipitation in the dry corridor, right? I mean, what is the future likely to look like from an environmental perspective, to the extent that we know? Right. Uh, that's also a good question. And yeah, is this, is this uh, you know, different timescales in climate, right? We were just talking about seasonal forecasting, so next three months, and we are pretty good at that. Because we understand current mechanisms and we understand the initial conditions in this uh, short-term uh, forecasting, we also know, you know, sea surface temperature is the main driver of changes worldwide. So we can have a, a, a pretty good approach to to uh, this uh, seasonal forecasting. Now, shifting from that time scale towards the end of the century incorporates a lot more of uncertainties. Mm. Um, that being said, models are. You know, you can run a model backwards to, to try to understand how good it is on reconstructing known uh, climate, and they're pretty good. So our our trust is there, our our uh, you know uh, hope is there. But remember that these climate models are driven mostly on behavior. It's not you know the math is the math, and uh, thermodynamic is the thermodynamics, right? Um, but the the driver between each of the p potential scenarios in climate is actually how much carbon dioxide we were going to put out. And that, just imagine how hard it is to 
figure out what policies are going to be in place. Let's say not even in the next five years, but you know what policies are going to be in place in thirty years to try to limit this amount of CO two. So again, when you include behavior, human behavior in this, uh, then it becomes more more complex. And if you add uh, politics, then there's another layer of, of complication. So um, the uncertainties are mostly attributed to that, to behavior and uh, you know CO two. Uh, radiative forcing that is completely, you know, behavioral, right? And so each of those scenarios has different outputs. The more extreme the business as usual would will um, have the largest impact. And you know, you could uh, you could say, um, you know, the uh, wettest regions are going to get wetter, the dryers are going to get drier. Uh, potentially, uh, um, you know, the the high pressure systems are going to be more. Um, stronger than they are now and you know an enhanced uh, atmospheric circulation pattern overall that will include droughts uh, in most of central america but again with large uncertainties in towards the end of the century mm-hmm. now we talk about climate change currently the trend again temperatures is very clearly going up and that is something we could actually start to incorporate in our models and our knowledge um, so let's talk about the nearer term, and I guess particularly what could be done in the nearer term to address what's happening mm-hmm. in America. So um, you and I are both based in the U.S. The Biden administration has talked about uh, $4 billion, I think, investing in the so-called root causes of migration in Central America. From a geographic, uh, climatological, environmental perspective, what are the things that that money could be used for to help local governments, community mm-hmm. groups, international organizations mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. do to um, mitigate the impact of this climate variability on these farmers and others, and which could in turn uh, affect their propensity to migration? Right. Uh, that's a that's the hardest question to uh, <laughs> throw at me thus far, um, because I think that just dealing with the top of the iceberg, which might be increased climate variability or climate extremes, it's not necessarily going to figure solve it, right? It's not going to, you know, um, go to the root of the problem. Um, corruption is a big deal in in this in these countries. Corruption undermines access to health, access to fair um, fertilizers, access to seeds. Uh, so that's for me the biggest point that we should attack under this administration. Um, so that that said. There's there's other uh, things that we can help um, improve. For instance, again, the the new um, seasonal forecast system is already in place in Guatemala with the Med Service. We um, ourselves made sure that institutionalization was the biggest part of this project. Right? We wanted to be out of there, having had the system in place and the technical capacities to fix it, improve it, and create their own. And that's a reality nowadays. Mm-hmm. Um, climate information in that sense can be used to inform um, good practices on the ground, right? Like, uh, you know, optimal um, sowing dates, uh, optimal fertilization schemes. So it, it could ease the agricultural end of wars, but only if paired with resources for action, right? Uh, a climate forecast is, uh, is worthless if, if there's no money to actually put those activities uh, on the ground, right? Yeah. Uh, and so, again, this is where uh, poverty, th- those structural challenges that we have in, in Guatemala and in all Central America with structural poverty, violence, and all these other complexities and so- social vulnerabilities, uh, a, a poor education system needs to be addressed, right? It's not only providing these climate services that is going to help us out. It's, 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 a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a good uh, start and it's going in the right direction. But it needs to be addressed from the deeper vulnerabilities that are uh, in depth rooted in Guatemala. Uh, that's probably a pretty good point to wrap it up on. Uh, so, yeah, thank you so much for coming on, Diego. This was super interesting. Diego Pons is an applied climatologist and assistant professor at Colorado State University, where he researches human environment interactions and implications for policy and development. He wrote an article for MPI's Migration Information Source, which touches on some of the points we talked about here, and that's called Climate Extremes, Food Insecurity, and Migration in Central America, a Complicated Network. Thanks so much for listening to Changing Climate, Changing Migration. 
If you enjoyed my chat with Diego, I'd encourage you to check out the other episodes of the podcast. Those are in our archives at migrationpolicy.org slash podcasts. And they're also available on your podcast app of choice. Subscribe to make sure you catch each and every new episode. You should also check out Diego's article and our full catalog of writing on climate change and migration at migrationpolicy.org slash climate. Get in touch by sending us an email at source at migrationpolicy.org. We'd love to hear what you think we're doing well and other questions we could explore on the show. This episode of the podcast was produced by Yusuf Hamid and Kenya Guerrero and made possible by Julia Yanoff, Michelle Middlestadt, and Lisa Dixon. Our theme music is a song called Touch by Patrick Petrikios. I'm Julian Haddam. Thank you for listening.